honestly, I think we have some interesting stuff to discuss. So, you know, anytime you're ready, let's get into it. <laughs> yeah. So we can start uh, with your relationship with tennis and how that got you started with it. Yeah. So I didn't come from a family of tennis players. Um, and, you know, my childhood was spent in Montreal, Canada. That's where I grew up for, for the majority of my childhood. Um, you but my speak parents French or what? Say that again? You speak French? My French is pretty bad. My Spanish is a little bit. Oh, c'est pas mal ça. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, nice. not going to swear word there. So, you, hey. <laughs> um, so I grew up in Montreal. Um, and, you know, my parents uh, are still both and were at the time classical musicians. They were playing for the Montreal Symphony, both of them. And, you know, growing up in a family where the expectation was we were all going to study an instrument and we would all be probably pretty excellent at it, um, you know, was in a way a kind of a blessing because my parents were so focused. They loved music. They loved performing. My parents would practice for hours and hours and hours. They had very unorthodox schedules. They would be around in the mornings when we were leaving, but then they would go and have a rehearsal in the afternoon, come back and then go perform at night. Um, you know, and, and I saw, you know, and, and spent hours practicing and, and traveling and doing all these things that being a really high level performer, whether it's an athlete or, or a musician or whatever else, um, you know, was really inspiring to watch. Um, and it really made me understand their work ethic and, and the passion that kept them playing, you know, same Brandenburg concerto every year, but you know, how can you make it better? How can it be a little bit improved? How can you be more in sync with the orchestra? Um, and so that was really inspirational. Um, and I grew up, <laughs> I think it was a blessing that I wasn't very good at music because my brother and sister who were good at music got a lot heavier of a critique, you know, from their, from their like elementary school performances, like, well, the bassoons were out of tune or like the, you know, the tubas didn't really hit their arpeggios. Um, but I was really into sports. And so the sport at the time that I had the most access to was skiing. So I was a really avid skier. I still ski obviously a lot less than when I lived in Montreal, but you know, there was an outlet for me to go and be athletic. And I loved it so much. I loved just the physicality of being in my body. I'm somebody who mm -hmm. thinks a lot um, and can kind of get trapped in my own head. And so sports for me was always a way that I felt really calm and peaceful that I could use my brain in a way that was in sync with my body. Um, and, you know, my parents would go on tour every summer. They would travel with the orchestra because that was really their season. They would go and play concerts in Korea and Japan and Zurich and, you know, Lisbon and wherever. Um, and sometimes I got to go with them and, and a lot of times I didn't. And the times that I didn't, um, I started going out to Arizona where my grandparents lived. Both of my parents uh, kind of grew up in Arizona. And, um, my grandmother, who was like this cool lady, she was so funny and weird and she was a nurse and she was kind of body and she was probably my favorite person on planet earth. Um, <laughs> she had in retirement started playing tennis. So she had picked up the game and was pretty good at it. And she, and it was a way for me to spend time with her. So she would wake up, you know how old people wake up at like four or five in the morning. <laughs> she would wake up every day in the summer and go play tennis for maybe like two hours, kind of before it got really hot. And I just remember tagging along with her because I wanted to be around her so much because she was so fun. And on one of those trips, I, I picked up a racket and it was just a natural fun thing for me to do. And so that sort of joy of being in the moment and tennis was the hardest thing I had tried up until that point. It's mm -hmm. such a hard sport. It really requires so much of you. Um, and that part was really evident to me from the beginning. I really liked how much of me it took to do well. Um, and so I grew up, you know, where I would play tennis in the summers and then kind of not really play ever, you know, other, other times just because there weren't, weren't very many courts to play on in Montreal and it wasn't really a, a culture. So that's where got started. Well, at uh, what age was that? Like, uh, what, when did you pick up Maybe a racket? Maybe like six, six, seven. Oh, you know. so it was still early. Yeah. Still early, still early. But, but it wasn't until a couple of years later, my parents got jobs in Atlanta. They were employed by the Atlanta Symphony. And that was a really big culture shock for me. I had traveled around a little bit. I had gone, like I said, on tours with them sometimes. So I actually had quite a bit of a sense of the world, or at least as much as you can when you're a little kid. You know, and my parents were very international. They're very cosmopolitan. They speak a lot of different languages. My dad is German. 
um, you know, they were, they were very open to the larger culture and, and, you know, world of travel and performance. And I always thought that was really cool. Um, and so when we moved to Atlanta, it's not a very cosmopolitan city. It's not a very international city. It's not a very progressive city. And I really had a hard time, um, figuring out what I was supposed to do there. And the thing that I loved the most, which was skiing, I couldn't do. Um, mm. but then I kind of realized, oh, wow, there's a lot of people here playing tennis. I wonder if right. this would be a thing for me. Um, and I quite quickly after we moved, we moved when I was about 11. Um, I started kind of taking it more seriously and I played my first couple of tournaments just because I wanted to, and my parents were not pushing me at all. They were kind of baffled about why I wasn't more into music so they were kind of like okay i guess if you want to play this sport don't you want to don't you want to practice music and i would say like no god it's the worst i hate playing music i don't want to do this but i do want to play sports um and so it was kind of evident and i'm sure the same is true for you like you know the people who kind of gravitate toward the sport it tends to be something that you find maybe is kind of natural and if you're not pushed yeah. like i wasn't pushed at all and it's something you find it's because it speaks to you in some very deep profound way um, and I, and I started playing tournaments and then I just found that I kept getting better and better. And then I started taking it more seriously. So you could say that really, I mean, you, you like you're saying you weren't pushed, so it kind of came from you quite a bit, huh? I mean, I, from the get go. Completely. And I think for me, um, you know, I don't want to get ahead too much cause I know you've structured our, our chat in a really thoughtful yeah. way, but even now the players I like watching most, we interview a lot of players for the racket magazine podcast. We talk about a lot of players, um, you know, in the magazine and other places and the ones I like the most, the ones I relate to the most, the ones I, I really am drawn to are the ones who don't seem like it's work. The ones who seem like there's some inner joy to what they're doing. And maybe they're the number one ranked player and winning a ton of grand slams like Federer seems like he's, joyous when he's playing tennis or maybe it's somebody who's kind of crazy but they like having fun and doing trick shots those are as appealing to me as ever it's the ones that feel like you know maybe they're they're waiting to get yelled at a little bit or it's not necessarily their own volition I have a harder time relating to them because for me tennis is it's about joy it's about um you know finding that sort of peace and that real that real enjoyment in the struggle of it because as you know tennis is a really unforgiving oh, yeah. one. it's really hard and you lose all the time. You don't win every week. If you did, you'd win every tournament and you don't. Only one person can win a tournament. So if you don't get okay with that process of winning some and losing some, but finding the joy in both of that, the, both of those processes, I think it's, it's a really hard road. And I think you can still yeah. succeed if you don't love it. People do, but not for me. And to this it's, day, uh, I still don't treat like those as much. Yeah. Tennis is, is one of those sports and I've always said this and I, I mean, I used to coach my kids like this and I still do. It's, it's, you know, that cliche uh, phrase that says, if you're not a good loser, there's no shot. You're going to be a great winner because in tennis, it just plays perfectly. I mean, you lose more than you win, truly. I mean, it, yep. uh, you know, you can have a losing record and still have a great career or you can break even and it's one of those, you know, it's kind of like a good business, you know, you can do bad, but you're still really good with it. Um, but um, yeah, so you could say that you found love for the sport quite well when you went to Atlanta, which is what age was that? It was 11. And then I really started playing tournaments, um, you know, when I was probably closer to 13 or so. I didn't play in the 12s. I played in the 14s and the 16s and the 18s and juniors. Um, and I liked it very much. It, I found it very, I liked the structure of it. And I liked you know, the downside of having two classical musician parents is that they were very wild and crazy and there was a lot of chaos and people coming in and, oh, this, you know, this contingency from Mexico is going to stay at our house and everyone's going to stay up late drinking tequila and playing music all night. You know, it was very fun and exciting. Um, but my house could also sometimes be very chaotic and unpredictable. So the, the predictability of tennis, like I go, this is my happy place. I train every day. And on the weekends, I play tournaments. And if I work hard and I really you know, try to listen to what my coaches are telling me, then I see myself slowly getting results and getting better. And I found that process, not because I felt like I needed to be the best tennis player or I wanted to, you know, raise a grand slam trophy over my head. I never really thought that that was very realistic for me. And that wasn't what drew me to the sport. It wasn't winning. It was the process of playing and how much love I had just for hitting the ball. And so for me, that was where I really found um, a lot of happiness. And it happened to be that, you know, that, that translated also to results. So I did, you know, 
start going to national tournaments and start getting a national ranking and, and doing better and better. But, you know, interestingly, the part of tennis that I really had, really had a hard time with um, was college tennis. I had a really tough time um, making, sort of synthesizing my love of the game and how much I had come to it with sort of an open spirit of creativity and my own relationship to it. Um, and I was really disappointed with college tennis. I thought it was going to be a lot better. I thought it was going to be a lot more fun to have teammates. And I thought it would be really cool because we're out there alone to have other people rooting for us and playing with us in a doubles match. And, and, and I didn't find that as much as I, as I wanted to. And I feel like, you know, there are probably some reasons why that I'm more than happy to talk about, but for a time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so in. Yeah. I've never, yeah, I've never, I mean, I've, I've experienced this for small amount of times as a player. I mean, you know, things that you have going on and, as a coach, also, I would see it at times, right, personalities and just different stuff on a team. But it's very interesting what you're saying, though. Like, well, I, I, th yeah. I think, I mean, you were one of the best, you were a, one of the best juniors and you were on one of the best collegiate teams, right? I mean, right. Miami was a fantastic team. They have a fantastic program. You know, for me, I wasn't quite good enough to go to your Stanford's or your Florida's or your you know, Duke or UNC or, 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 uh, schools like that. And so for me, the equation of college was really, you know, I don't know what you know about classical musicians, but they're not very wealthy. So the, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the option for me to get a college education really was you have to get a scholarship. There's not a, there's not another option. There's not a backup plan. Um, mm -hmm. and so I really tried to be thoughtful about what I wanted to study and what I wanted to do with my career because I kind of knew, and I grew up with enough really good players, you know, like there's a girl, um, B Bielik is her name. She's a really good friend of mine. Um, and B played, uh, and was an all American in, at, um, Wake Forest. She played on the tour, mm -hmm. you know, players like her were so clearly going to not only be excellent college players, but also have a chance to make it on the professional tour. Um, there were a couple others that I grew up with like that. There's a girl called Ansley Cargill who played at Duke who ended up going on to the tour. So there were enough players where it was like, huh, there's a difference between their level and my level. Right. And it's not, and it's not, part of it is probably raw talent and, um, you know, probably a lot I'm of other things. Bringing practice, yeah, a lot, could, yeah. A lot of different things. Um, and I never felt resentful. I never felt like, oh, I deserve to be, you know, number one. I would play and try my absolute hardest. And then, you know, the third round at nationals, I would get my butt kicked. So I was kind of like, okay, I'm doing pretty well, but I'm not going to be that player who's going to necessarily, you know, qualify for, you know, the Stanford team and maybe try to make a professional goal out of it. So for me, tennis was yeah. never, was never a professional ambition, not because I didn't love the pro game. I love, I loved watching tennis. I still do at a, at a very high level or just recreational. But for me, it was more about the joy of it. Um, so I kind of realized, okay, well, I want to go and study something that I feel very passionate about because I know mm. that college for me will be, you know, a, a effectively a, a jumping block. It will be a stepping yeah. stone. And so what do I want to do? I knew I wanted to be a journalist. I had a newspaper on my block when I was 12 years old that I would report about the other neighbors, um, you know, and telling stories was really, really appealing to me. And so I kind of knew, okay, well, of the schools that were recruiting me, which ones have good journalism programs. And I picked one that had one of the best. Unfortunately, we had a really bad tennis team and we got so crushed so often. And I think maybe that had to do with how. Yeah, that can be. My experience was. That can be, I've actually heard of these careers where, you know, the kid ends up going to a school, you know, that, that, you know, not to talk about, you know, other schools, but that just is not good level. And yeah. so you're experience as a whole it's really not the same the resources are not the same at all either the resources um, are totally not the same and and yeah. also our coach was terrible we had a terrible coach he didn't know what he was doing and he didn't really like women or women's tennis or really seem to know very much about the game um so i mm -hmm. felt like and i it was funny because i had a in my class so my recruiting class there was a girl who had only played at Voluntary. There were two girls who came from um, Bulgaria and the Czech Republic, respectively. And we all got worse when we got to college. And it was sort of like, how is this possible? How are we getting worse at tennis, despite the fact that we're, you know, theoretically on a team and with all this support? Um, 
And so that was a little bit hard for me to understand. And I really wanted to like it very much. Um, you know, and obviously I played all four years. I was a four-year letterman. I won, you know, big 12 player of the week one, one uh, week because I overcame food poisoning to win, you know, some clutch <laughs> Just say, Yeah, like, that was good too. Eh? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I, I had some moments that I really look back on and, and I liked very much. Um, but for the most part, I had a really hard time in college tennis. And, you know, my last match when I was a senior, I was playing at Texas A&M in College Station, and they were hosting the Big 12 College Championships. And my team had lost, and I was still battling it out. I think we'd split sets. But, you know, in a college match, if everyone else has finished their matches, you don't finish. Um, and I remember being like, okay, it's over. And I took off my shoes, and I took it's off my so socks. Tough. It's it was so tough. tough. It was also, I was ready for it to be over because I didn't really like it. And I took off my shoes and my socks and I took <laughs> off my tennis bag and I left my rackets on the court and I just walked off barefoot. And I don't know what oh, happened to any of those equipment. Like, I mean it. I was ready to be done. I was ready not to be done with the game. I love the game. Um, but I was ready to be done with that college tennis experience um, sooner than I thought. And so it took me a while to find my love for the sport again. Um, but when I wow. did, I never left. As a as a former college coach, I uh, that that kind of like touches me a lot, right? Because I always, my, I mean, my my biggest pride was that this kid or any kid that goes through this program has the best experience, right? And uh, yeah, that's tough. That can be tough because I never really actually met somebody um, that went through that personally. Um, I always knew of the kids, yeah. right? Because they were there. Um, but I never met somebody and that could, that could take a toll. I mean, I'm, I'm sure after you graduated, like to get, like you just said, the love for the sport, uh, yeah. took you maybe a little bit. Yeah, How I did you get it back? I had to find it again. It was interesting. So after college, I moved to Spain. I lived in Spain for a while. Um, and then I moved to China. I lived in, um, uh, Beijing and I worked at a magazine. So I knew I wanted to be in journalism. I had gone to this good journalism school and was able to get a first couple of jobs. I was, I had interned at a few magazines in New York. Um, and so I was just kind of like, okay, I'm not ready to go back. There's not really a context in which this is fun. I mean, looking back on it, I'm like, oh my God, you idiot. You lived in Spain for a year and you didn't play on those beautiful red clay courts. Like, what were you thinking? But you know, at the time I just couldn't deal with it. So I played other sports. I played f sports for fun and I regained that feeling of what it feels like to really love something. Um, and I just decided I wasn't really ready to go back to tennis. And so I lived um, in Beijing for almost two years. And then I moved to DC to get a job. Um, I ended up working at the Washington Post. And, you know, I would ha like have a, an occasional hit. Like I, you know, I had some old Prince graphites from like juniors that I hadn't thrown love away. Them. I um, love them. Such great rackets. So I had like 15 rackets from juniors from, you know, my Prince sponsorship. And I dug them out of a closet somewhere. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll like, just go and play with my friends. But going and playing with friends, you know, I was still good at tennis. I just hadn't played in five, six years, but it was still mm. like, oh, this is a fun way. Like I actually just really like playing with my friends. I don't have to keep score. I don't have to feel like there's pressure on me to, to deliver any kind of victory or, or getting berated by my coach because our team didn't do as well as he thought we would do. Um, and I really started to slowly find it again. And then it's interesting because it kind of, it kind of foreshadows where, where I am now, but I moved to New York in 2007 to get a job at Time Magazine and through a friend who I had worked with in China, a journalist who now runs something called the Rocky Mountain News, which is like an environmental newspaper out in mm -hmm. Colorado. He was like, hey, a really good friend of mine lives in New York. He and I used to work in Cambodia together and he loves tennis. You guys should meet each other. Just say hi. Like, he's really cool. You'll really like him. Um, and I met him at a bar and we just kind of had like a chat and we were talking about all of our favorites and like Gabby Sabatini and the one hand of backhand and, you know, Tomas Musser and he tore his leg up and he practiced on a chair and just finding like all these moments where we had, mm -hmm. you know, Horace Becker winning Wimbledon at 15 and there he is, or 17 and there he is collapsing on the grass. And I'm yeah, like, 17, 17. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, like exactly, 1985, uh, you know, he was 17 and, and just kind of remembering like, oh man, I love this sport so much. And he was like, hey, this is kind of weird, but I have two tickets to the U.S. Open tomorrow. Do you want to go? And I had never been. Um, and it never would have occurred to me to go to it. Um, but we went the next night uh, and we watched Justine Hennen beat, beat Venus Williams. And then we watched David Ferrer take out Rafa in five sets 
we were there until three in the morning. I was like, this is amazing. This is the most fun thing. And this guy was just so fun. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, his name is David Shaftel. And he and I just had this instant connection about this game. And so we started playing and it got me like back into the rhythm of playing again. And slowly I found friends who, like me, had played in college and you know, maybe some of them had spent a little bit of time on the tour, or maybe some of them had had a good junior career, but, you know, had an injury or whatever. But I slowly formed this community of people to play with. Um, and it really, really reignited my passion. But it was really because of Dave. And Dave and I, you know, basically spent a decade, at least seven years or so, just being friends, talking, going out, playing tennis, hanging out, doing stuff. And, um, and he's who I started Racket Magazine with. Yeah, I was gonna ask you. This is Dave, Dave, right? The yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Is because this, I, you know, this is this is part of this is part of even what tennis between lines is, which is that connection that you have with somebody that just comes from from nothing, from just tennis, and and you can just click in into that you know um, how you call it into that wavelength that yeah. you're in the same one, the same one as I am right now, and yeah. I just started talking to you, and so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, and if that, if you have that experience, you know, you instantly, yeah. you know, you can make jokes and have a similar sense of humor and have, you know, read a lot of the same books, but we just had this initial like vocabulary to talk to each other. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because in our friendship over those seven years where we were just like, you know, becoming better friends and we would like try to set one of, you know, he would try to set me up on a date and I would go and be his wing woman at a thing. And we were just like, we just really enjoyed each other's company. Um, and we would play together and, and hang out and all that stuff. And eventually that vocabulary that we created, that language that we were speaking to each other, mm -hmm. um, it dawned on us that we should do a thing about tennis together. We weren't sure what it would be or what container it would take, but we knew we wanted it to be this kind of idea. Like it has to be about celebrating the ideas about tennis and some of the greatest moments and also what's cool now that nobody else is paying attention to. And the fact that tennis used to speak a lot to art and culture and music and movies and books. And where did that go? Does it still exist? And maybe people just stop paying attention or, or yeah. are we going to have to reinvent it? And, and it slowly sort of took shape, but it took that decade of friendship and that decade of shared language and shared vocabulary of us sharing pictures. We found of like, Oh, look at this cool picture of Bjorn Borg coming out of studio 54 and his fur coat, you know, and, Look at Yannick Noah in his hotel room, Jake and Seven Up. You know, it was just that, sort of this like slow build, and right. it clicked in in twenty. Interestingly, after we both had kids, we both had he had a he had he now has two kids and I have one. But after we had kids, I think there's a thing with um you know with having children. You don't have mm -hmm. to have children certainly, but but sometimes if you do, you start thinking about how you spend your time and what you really want to be doing. Right. If you're going to be away from them, and if you're going to be at work that's great. And everybody should have balance, obviously, between yeah. their work and their families and sometimes in both ways, right? Like you need time away to be yourself and be an individual, but also have time, obviously, with your family. But if you do spend time away from your family, you want it to be really meaningful. You want to- And how, find, how you're spending yeah, that time. Exactly. Yeah. How you're spending that time and just any job or just any career, for me anyway, didn't seem as exciting. Like, well, I would just rather be with my kids. So I really have to like what I'm doing. I really want to make use of my time. And sometimes having less time and not having to be in your head and think about it too much. And how am I going to do this? And we have to make the perfect plan. You don't have that time anymore because your life is so taken up with all this other stuff. So you just think, okay, what can I do tonight? I have an hour before I get tired and after I put the kid to bed. So I have an hour. What am I going to do with that hour? Am I going to watch some dumb TV or am I going to read some dumb stuff? Or am I going to try to make something? And it was so clear mm -hmm. that we should make something. And after we both had kids, we kind of both realized we want to be spending time in a way that allows us to enjoy each other as people, us to be able to go home to our families and enjoy what we're doing because the time mm -hmm. we've spent away from them has been worth it. And we saw this huge hole of an opportunity in the tennis space that didn't have a concentrated place where this kind of cultural conversation could happen. And we wanted to be part of helping not only our own conversation, but helping conversations everywhere else. Because the truth is a lot of my tennis time was wonderful and I loved it and I still do and I play all the time. Um, but Sometimes I felt really lonely. I felt really lonely being a good tennis player who was also really smart because on my tennis team, nobody else took academics seriously at all. So I was like the only one studying or trying to do well in school. On the other hand, among all my nerdy friends, and I'm a total nerd, so I say that with no denigration, 
On the other hand, in, in, with all my nerdy friends, they would never understand how I needed to do sports. I need to right. go. I need to go get on the court. There's a part of me that doesn't feel okay unless I can get that expression of myself out there. And and having that other person, and then finding all these other people, yourself included, who are who are interested in both those things, was really really gratifying. And it was amazing how instant it happened. As soon as we made the magazine, even the first one, even though it was sort of kind of out of nowhere and people didn't really understand it. Yeah. The people who did understand it really understood it. And it felt like we kind of had accomplished already what we wanted to do, which was not just make something cool, but make something that connected us with other people, you know? And that's oh, really yeah. what guides what we do. Like we're mainly interested the, in connecting, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, my, my career, my journey has been completely interesting. I mean, I, I've just been a player and a coach. That's what I've been. And I've done it at a high level. And I was just walking through an airport and Stretch Armstrong just like shows up with this like rocket magazine and, and he says hello and I'm like, what what is that? And he just show he's like, You can keep it yet. Yeah. I mean, I was in the airplane, I couldn't stop reading. I'm like, What's happening? What is this? I, why are they talking about like this weird double rich tournament in New York, like this story that Craig wrote? I'm like Okay, so after, yeah, anyways, I, I'm getting in passion into racket, but really I just, it, it's exactly what you just said, which is the people that get it, got it, right? And just, it's a nice, nice little space there. And I mean, I'm, tell me. Let me ask you a question, because I think for me, one of the most satisfying relationships I've had, because it really allowed me to come to terms with myself, um, is with the pro player, Andrea Pekovic. Um, who's become a you know player. you know that Andrea and I, and like, I know she you guys know, know who I am. She does what she does. Oh, good, good, yeah, good, good, good. No, but she, she was clear. I, I mean, I used to make fun of her dancing even when we were juniors. Yeah, go ahead. You can't think of something else. But it's interesting because when I wrote her to participate in the magazine, I suspected she would get it just because I know she's very into books. And it's interesting because through my friendship with her, and she's contributed to many, many art, many pieces in the magazine where she does a podcast, yeah. you know, it's, it's really organic, but it's also interesting because in a lot of ways, we've been able to have a conversation about how we're kind of the flip side of each other. Like there's a huge part of her that wants to be like an intellectual who lives in New York and writes for magazines and live. And for me, I, the, the expression of being an athlete and understanding, like, it's very hard to synthesize those two things, right? Oh and yeah. Think, oh yeah. But when you meet people who do that, and so that's that's leading up to a question for you, which is what about what about the culture? What about in starting this made you feel like it was maybe missing before and just being a great coach and being a great player wasn't enough? Like what was it that sort of got you over the edge where you were like, oh, I want to oh. connect more with people. I want to say something about the sport. Like what was that? Well, I, I listen, I'm still trying to figure it out. But um, I've always, always, since I was very little, I mean, since I was very little, my dad was telling me, you need to write scripts for Hollywood. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, okay, dad, yeah, sure. And it's because I would like, you know, come up with stories and come up with things. And my dad's like, that's, you know, you need to write. And I love, love, love writing. I've, I've written, I mean, I've written a bunch, not about tennis, but I've written, you know, um, Reading, writing was always been my thing. I did psychology back in college. Um, I always wanted to know why. This is like why, why, why people do what they do. Why is this happening like this? Why do they make that decision and not this one? Like I was always very interested about the behind. Um, I did a master's and I was pretty into the research part of it. Like I was, I'm very into the why behind things. Um, right. Yeah. I don't know if I should have done journalism. I have no clue. Um, I no, was always no. very, I mean, my life was, I'm a professional tennis player. This is what I'm doing. I trained, I prepared myself. This is, I mean, I was preparing myself to be that. I was 18, you know, I was what, 460, doing great, passing qualities. My dad's like, we don't have any money, go to college. Like it was a little bit confusing at that time. Um, but I mean, I ended up doing great in college. I realized, oh, okay, to be a pro now, I need to get money from my pocket or a sponsor. So there's really no, I, I mean, I have no spot to do this now. Mm -hmm. And I decided, you know, get your visa. You need to do something for yourself, which means you need to study. So I had to do a master's and essentially, yeah, I've always truly been a nerd, but it's been overshadowed by the fact that 
I've played and I've coached. And then I got into coaching, right? Which is part of my personality as well. I'm a very given person, given, given, given. I give you first, me second, you first, me second. And that's kind of, I did well there. Um, and my psychology and my emotional connection to the kids and, you know, getting them to be great women and confident and that side of yeah. also my personality. I have had you as a coach, you know, we, I could have used yeah. it. Oh, no, I was going to just tell you, like, I, you know, if I would have known, I would have recruited, you would have done well, probably Miami. We had nerds and we had hard workers. Yeah. So there you go. Um, <laughs> but so I had that side of me and then I decided, you know, I need to continue growing and in terms of my job. It wasn't the timing to either take the head coaching job or go anywhere else at this time, my personal life, I'm here, I'm very happy here. And I said, listen, I don't know, I need something to do. So I said, I'm going to give myself some time and I'm just going to coach. I'm going to go to a nice club, which is, I just knew of this club. And uh, I never wanted to be a club coach. I mean, I've done things at such a high level. And I don't say that like in a bad yeah. way. I just mean, yeah. I, I, I didn't want to go to a club that was just a club, right? I wanted to go to a club that was growing. I didn't want to go into a big academy because I didn't want to be part of that. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to have my own voice. It was my own voice. So in this club, I mean, Miami Beach is growing immensely. They have an academy. I was brought in mostly to, to basically grow that academy with better kids. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and essentially bring good tennis to Miami Beach. And, and it's, it's pretty cool. And so I'm around, I mean, listen, I'm around uh, filmmakers, doctors, like all these cool people that are playing with me. They're older, they're younger, they're women, they're men. I have a little kid. I have a younger one, an 11 and 12. And it's like, you know, every lesson, it's like it, they do this to my brain. I'm like, oh, reset. I have to teach now this type of level, right? But um, it's interesting because it got me, my creative juices are, I mean, I, I just I've been always very creative very into painting and writing and reading my dad was actually he studied uh branding and journalism like wow. I have a little bit of that's that um, so that's well, it. Let me, I, I think what you're saying and I think the reason it makes sense that you're interested in both these things in duality is you know now that we're doing racket and like I said, we're just as interested in the culture and the recreational player and somebody maybe who hasn't even picked up a racket and just yeah. likes the aesthetics of the, of the sport. You know, we're doing a piece on Wes Anderson, who I think maybe played a little high school tennis, but certainly wasn't. A I, have, I have five there. Hey, look at those. <laughs> um, but I think like what is interesting to me is when we do talk to pro players, um, especially ones who have excelled and really achieved at a really high level, you know, the, the search for meaning in your life doesn't go oh. away if you figure out how to play tennis really well, you know, and we had a guest this week on the podcast. Um, you, just, you, just, you just hit the nail in the head. Big True. Time. And yeah. she said, you know, like she won a grand slam and then had nobody to celebrate, but her mother, because she had never learned how to make friends and didn't know how to be happy with herself. You know, Mary Pierce told us a story yesterday. She's going to be the next guest on the podcast. And she told us a story yesterday about how she's never felt closer to that original love she had playing tennis growing up in mostly Bradenton, Florida, than when she gets on the court and hits with kids from Mauritius and helps them have that first experience with tennis that she had when she was living in a car with her family because they had no money. And yeah. just, you know, she could have been, she's won two Grand Slams. She's won a couple Fed Cups. She could just be doing the celebrity circuit and commentating and you know, hosting celebrity fundraisers, but it was important to her yeah. to go back to this place that touched her and give back to the sport in a way that she had, it gave her a sense of meaning. And I think, look, everybody struggles with meaning in their life, whether they're a really great tennis player or a medium okay tennis player like me or somewhere in between, which is what you are. But the truth of it is, you know, just being good at something doesn't give you that meaning. It's making a, an attachment to it, understanding what about it draws you and continuing to learn, right? Like there's no, yeah. there's no play, like, I've changed my tennis game in the past couple of years. I'm continuing to improve even as I get slower and, you know, less fit as I approach 40 years old. But I think that constant search for that perfect point or that perfect day where I'm feeling great and I'm hitting a one hit a backhand beautifully, like yeah. that still animates me as much. Or maybe I met a great friend who I'm now going to hang out with and play tennis with. Like 
those things are all additive and they don't have very much to do with how many matches I won or how many I lost, you know? No. And I think when you no. look beyond that, so when you were saying about dealing with parents who only want to hear what's yeah. going to get my kid into the top 10, what's going to get my kid into the top five, what's going to get my kid a, you know, a sponsorship, a, a scholarship, whatever it is, you know, mm-hmm. I guess I understand why they're asking those questions for sure, because it's yeah. a lot of sacrifice and it's a lot of hard work to get to where you're even looking at things like that. But at the mm-hmm. same time, if you don't have a place for the joy of it and the meaning of it, and it can't, you be, won't get there. You it doesn't. Won't. And even if you do get there, it won't mean anything. It's you know? miserable. Yeah, miserable. it's miserable. You'll be alone yeah. and you'll be sad, even if you have a trophy case that's full. And so I'm yeah. really always interested in meeting people who are beginners, long lost players, somebody who's an amazing player still, or maybe was at one point. But yeah. what really binds them together is the idea that this sport can teach you and continues to teach you something about yourself, something about other people, and allows you to make those connections with other people because they've been, as I said, the most profound of my life. Um, you know, sure. this is coming from a kid who didn't grow up with a really strong tennis culture. You know, it's just this sport has given me a lot, and for me, that's why starting racket and doing everything we are with it is sort mm-hmm. of my it's my way of making peace with it. It's my way of finding my way back to loving it. Um, and it's my sort of love letter to it because I want more people yeah. to love it the way that I do. Um, and not just because it's cool to watch people hit a ball at each other across the net. I mean, that's fine too, but there's yeah. a, so many more ways to get involved in it or, or to be into it. And, and I want our conversations to do that. I want them to pull people in, you know? Yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I always said this because the most profound that I've been with the sport has been through coaching because through playing, you know, I did great and I was on the court a lot and, uh, you know, tennis was kind of like my platform for, for getting great as a person. Like I just used it to, I mean, obviously I loved it and I wanted to win, but it was every day I knew I was getting just greater and greater. I knew how to deal with my emotions. And yeah. the moment that, that, that I said, you know, that I was telling my coach, like, Hey, how would you beat me? Let's go. I need to know. Like that moment, I knew I was just being great. But what you just said there about making peace with it, with making racket, it's, you know, I think it's a little bit, it talks to me why now, because I've always, you know, when I went to college, my first question to my academic advisor was, oh, okay, so she was like, what do you want to study? And I go, yeah, I want to be an interior designer. And Mm -hmm. she's like, no, you can't be an interior designer. I'm like, what do you mean I can't be an interior designer? She's like, you don't have time to be an interior designer. You're in Miami. You're a D1 top athlete, you know. And I was like, oh, so, and she's like, what's the next thing? And I'm like, um, the next thing is I love to know why and I love to, you know, be with people. And she's like, what about psychology? And so that's kind of how that happened. I think it's really important to make things, to make, to start things, to try things. And I think what is the downside sometimes of playing college athletics? Cause it's really interesting. Like I like to hire athletes when I can, um, uh, or any kind of folks who've really gone through some sort of hardship, like a fancy school on a resume isn't as impressive to me as somebody who's like self-made. And I think Mm -hmm. most athletes are self-made. Most athletes know what it has been to juggle two careers. They've already had a career before they had a career. They had their tennis Mm -hmm. career. And then the ones who played in college had to balance academics and their own, you know, professional ambitions with this college Mm -hmm. career. Like you don't just get a D1 scholarship and then you're done. You have to earn it every year. You have to justify Mm -hmm. why you're in the lineup. You have to keep working. And and at times it's harder because you're not necessarily being recognized as an individual, or maybe you don't have the good sort of resources that you did when you were junior. At least that was my case, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because your coach is terrible and doesn't know what they're doing. So, so for me, it was more about how do I, how do I take the really good things about being an athlete, which are being goal oriented and, and being responsible and learning how to lose with elegance and win with integrity and look my face, my teammates and myself in the mirror and say, I've done as much as I can. I've prepared as much as I can. I'm leaving everything I can on the court. Um, and you know, I can't control everything, but the parts I can control, I'm going to try my very best. And that really stays with you. But I think the downside is, and I've had this conversation with a lot of tennis players because they're so used to being alone and because they're so self-directed, I think sometimes they can have a hard time with the creative, with the starting of things, because they need to sort of feel motivated um, 
or maybe they're scared because they haven't done it before and it's not something they're good at. And I think the most interesting people to me are the people who are not afraid of failing, but are kind of like, I'm going to start, I'm going to try, I'm going to create, I'm yeah. going to build. And I think building is really, really, really useful because to me, the most interesting people are the ones who keep building and don't ever lose their appetite for trying things because I think it's really easy to settle into only doing things you're good at. Um, but the truth is the most interesting people sure. are who fail all the time. And I think part of making stuff involves that risk of failure and that's exhilarating. That's like the point, you know, being successful sure. all the time and winning at everything is boring. You know, if you're not doing, <laughs> if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not taking big enough risks. That's my view anyway. Yeah. Tell that to, to Roger Federer. That's funny. <laughs> he doesn't need my advice. Um, that's true. <laughs> um, tell me, so let's get just a little bit into racket so we get that, that, that chunk um, in there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you finished, you graduated, you went and did a lot of jobs, then maybe, what, five, six years ago, you started racket with David, your pal. Um, what's been your favorite thing about what racket has basically given you in your life? It's a good question. I would say for me, the sense of community that we found early on. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when you start your own thing because you have a vision and you have ideas and you certainly have a plan and that plan can change, but you kind of go forward, uh, you know, obviously knowing what you know at the time. And what was interesting to me, and this is, this has kept happening, which is really cool, is the stuff that we experience or that we get from people who come to us is cooler and more interesting and more ambitious than things we necessarily even thought of. Like you mentioned Stretch Armstrong, the DJ who is one of New York's original hip hop, uh, you know, heavyweights. He was the DJ at Columbia University. He had his own show. He has his own show on NPR. He discovered Nas and on a bunch and put Biggie Smalls on the, on, on the air. You know, this guy is a legend and he's cool and he's funny. Um, you know, he came to our party and was like, Hey, how can I get involved? How can I do something with you guys? What can I do? What can we do together? And it's like, would we ever have naturally organically thought that like somebody like that would be in our creative circle, making things with us? Not necessarily, but that's the part right. that's amazing. If you leave room for the plan to sort of expand based on what kind of comes back at you. So for me, I've never been interested in making something so that I can have the authority so that I can have the last word or control over anything. That's not interesting to me. What's interesting to me is starting something and putting it out into the world and then kind of seeing what the dialogue is, right? Like racket to me is a lot more of a dialogue with tennis lovers and people who maybe don't know they love the sport already. They, they're discovering mm -hmm. it along with us, but in that discovery, they can come to us and share something with us too. So it really is an exchange. And I think, you know, yeah. like I, I met Andrea because I wrote her and asked her if she wanted to write And she had 20 ideas and a lot of them were things I never even have heard of. Can we do a podcast together? Can we start a book club? Can we do all these things? Can what kind of videos can we do? And I was like, wow, okay. And then through her, I met Renee Stubbs, somebody who I grew up watching and, and obviously still enjoy as a commentator. But she was like, hey, let's go out and play. What do you want to do? What is Racket about? How can I get involved? And it was sort of like, huh, okay, all these people are coming to us because we're we're allowing for the flexibility and the mm -hmm. nimbleness of, of the moment to sort of happen organically. And I think sometimes if you get too rigid in your own idea, well, that's, that's racket and that's not racket. It's sort of right. like, that's boring to me. Why would I do that? You know, I don't work for anybody else. I work for myself. So anything <laughs> that I find interesting and anybody I find interesting, we'll find a way to work with them. We'll find a way to, to create something out of that dialogue, but it's the dialogue that I find really interesting. It's kind of the same as tennis. Like, right. Did I feel really good when I switched from a two-handed into my one-handed backhand a couple of years ago? Yeah, I felt really good, especially when I could start hitting it and like I had a passing shot up the line once when I was playing with Renee, and I was like, "Yeah." Okay. <laughs> um, but it's not that moment. I'm sure. Do you remind her of that moment constantly, or what? I don't win that oh, many okay. points against Renee, so yes, I do. She doesn't yeah, let me get it. it. <laughs> um, but I think, like you know, it wasn't 
the one shot or the one moment. It was like, I enjoyed so much the practice of being bad at it and seeing myself getting better at it. And again, it's still something I'm working on. Like, I'm sure now that I haven't been playing tennis, my timing's going to be off. I'm sure my forehand's all over the place. My positioning is probably going to be weird and my footwork is not going to be great. But I think you have to be able to enjoy the process and not just, am I proud that we've made a couple of really good, beautiful issues with really great stories? Sure. But it's more, am I mostly kind of amazed and impressed that like, the things that kind of took us in interesting directions, we were flexible enough and open-minded enough to kind of embrace them and, and go in. And make them happen. Yeah. That's the part that I think is really exciting. And that's the part that really, you know, makes me happy and, and really engaged with it. So that's that there's not really a, a one answer. There's stuff I like more than others that we've done, but more than anything else, I like the fact that we intended it to be a dialogue and that's how people see it. And that's the part that makes me feel like we're never going to run out of ideas or people to work with, because as long as we still have that exchange, it's always going to be exciting. Yeah. So I had, um, one of my questions was about really the love of tennis for you and how you had it. And through all this conversation, you had it and then, but you kind of lost it and then you came back into it and now it's kind of like growing uh, with bracket and it's staying in your life for, for quite a bit and I think it's going to stay. Um, but, but it's interesting, right? Because it was always meant to come back because it started from you. You know, oh, yeah. it, it, never, started, it never went away. I just lost touch of what it, just, it was. Right. It's yeah. kind of like, to me, I mean, not to compare myself to Andre Agassi, but like, Please do. Please do. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think when people think of me, they probably think Andre Agassi should be part of the conversation. No, I think, um, you know, it was interesting because Andre Agassi wrote a whole book about how much he hated tennis. And then at the end of the book, he comes back to the understanding that tennis has made him who he is. It's given him this life. It's, it's created this relationship with his wife. And there's a purity to his love that was always there, but it was obscured by a lot of other stuff, you know? And I think the parts that I didn't like about some of the later stages of juniors when it got really competitive and there was cheating and parents who were crazy. And, you know, one time a, a dad broke another dad's arm uh, right outside of the Where? playing. It wasn't my, I was in um, the, uh, it was at Zonals in North Carolina. I wasn't, wow. neither, was, neither my parent nor the parent of my opponent. So we were just- I like, hope oh. because they- but, You know, it gets crazy. And cheating yeah. and, you know, on the team, um, our coach would sort of like do this thing in college where we, he would sandbag the lineup. So he would put the better players at five and six. And then we were like, look, we're not, that's not going to help us beat Texas. Like Texas has six really good players. Like even if you put our number one player at number six, like that's not a guaranteed win. Like just let us play. Like let us. Listen, and I'm no, sorry, as a, as, a like college coach, as a college coach, the fact that they were not, challenging that is because you had no shot we had no shot and we yeah. knew it and it was just it was just depressing to be like we know we have no shot you're doing crazy stuff. no it was I'm terrible sorry. and that in it you know he would he would sort of say like well <laughs> you know uh yeah it was it was a bad um, i can't be that i gotta edit this out this is hilarious though oh my god um you can leave as much as you want to and but <laughs> So tell me, um, yeah. sitting here, uh, your vision for Racket, uh, what, what's new, what's coming? Can you talk about it? Can you not talk about it? Uh, let's see. Some of the stuff I can talk about is we are doing at least one film, um, which I'm really excited about. We have, yeah, it's a, Racket has a mission. And, you know, obviously a lot of what I've said about our community and our dialogue with people and wanting to bring new fans in is, is very mission centric. But the way we actually think about doing that is really, really concretely, right? Like we, we, we publish women, we publish people of color, we publish people who maybe don't write that much about tennis, because we want this to feel representative of the true tennis fanship, which is way more than just bankers who wear Roger Federer logos head to toe, right? And, and so really, yeah. the things that really speak to us with our mission are to talk about things like elitism and access and money. And they're also to talk about some of the stuff that's really right about the sport, which is it's the only sport as a professional athlete, as a woman, you can make anything approximating equal to a man. It's still not equal, but it's close or than other mm -hmm. sports. And yeah. the fact that it's an amazingly global sport that has roots in literally every continent. And now we have champions from every continent. Um, and I think for me, that's a really, really fascinating and underappreciated part of this sport. It's a really timeless, amazing 
way to kind of tap into a global community. And so all the projects we do, we have a book coming out in August, um, which will be a compilation of some of our favorite essays in the last um, sort of the first three years of the magazine. Um, and we'll have this film hopefully coming out. Um, I don't exactly know when, but we're working on it now. It's in development. And it has to do with the idea of basically looking at some of the fundamental problems with the sport and how we can fix them. And for me, you know, there are a lot of things I would like to fix about tennis. Um, and there are a lot of things that I think we should be celebrating a lot more than we are. And I can tell you the things that I find really boring about tennis, or at least the tennis media conversation. You know, if I, if I never talk to somebody about the big three or, you know, how, how much grand slams matter that ever again, that would be fine. I don't ever need to have that conversation again. I'm glad that people <laughs> like those players and I'm glad that they have their fans. But the truth is the, you should go to a tennis tournament and you should try to see tennis up close and you should go to your college tennis matches and, and get a racket and get a court on yourself because tennis is an amazing sport and it doesn't need to be, you know, I saw this Grand Slam champion play that Grand Slam champion. No, you just need to go and experience what's amazing about this sport. You don't go to a baseball game and say, okay, well, you know, Derek Jeter isn't playing today. I guess I won't watch this baseball game. No, you go for the entirety of the sport. You go for the pitcher and batter duels. You go for the infield. You go for the atmosphere. You go for the whole experience of it. And and I think tennis hasn't done a good enough job of sort of marketing the sport and what makes it so hard and exhilarating and interesting and global. Um, and I think we have real. I think we have a lot of room to help there. And I think also, you know, telling stories in film and in book form and podcasts are are really, for me, it's, it's what is the interesting medium that's going to help elevate this conversation the most. In some cases, maybe the story is meant to be an article in the magazine, but maybe this is meant to be a six part podcast series, or maybe this is a fiction documentary, or maybe this is something else. And so I'm pretty open-minded in terms of what I think we can do. Um, and the film and the book, the book more concretely, it's called Racket Magazine, the book, um, and it's coming out on Penguin Verso in, uh, in August. So I'll definitely make sure you get a copy early and we can talk about it if you want. No. Tennis is incredibly cool. It's incredibly dynamic. I don't think mm -hmm. we've discovered or made anything with Racket that, that talks about anything that wasn't already known. It was just right. the people who market the sport got really lazy and they got really fat and happy off of the profits that they were making and they didn't think to be generous and to lift all the other boats and i think when we do stories about how the tennis world is broken it's with the aim of making it better because i want people who are you know like like i said we were talking to mary pierce yesterday and the reason she went and sponsored and showed up in person and coached and mentored players in mauritius around the part of the african islands that that is part of was because she looked at those players and thought i needed to live in a van with my dad who was beating me at the time to play this sport and it was hard as hell and we came from a rich country with a rich tennis institution yeah. and i'm not going to go and help people who don't need my help i'm going to go give the, this person their first chance at tennis because that's what i would have loved to have had and i thought that was really really generous and really useful and i think the more people like that who lead the tour the more it'll look like what something like you and i want to see like yeah. billy Jean king has been talking about the need for a unified tour and the need for inspiring activism and participation since the 70s she created the wta yeah. tour she created the legislation that allowed for you and me to go to college yeah. title nine was a huge huge step forward for women athletes in every sport olympic sports soccer basketball everything mm -hmm. that we see now in terms of women's athletic accomplishments in the last three decades has because oh, yeah. of Billie Jean yeah. king and the women who who fought for title nine that's huge i wouldn't have mm -hmm. gone to college without title nine maybe you wouldn't have either and so for me it's, it's not that these are, these ideas aren't established or these ideas aren't out there. It's sometimes being powerful and getting people's ear can take a couple of different forms. And I think, yeah, like getting it, it out there. Like, and it's not, I don't think that Billie Jean King has it failed because she has failed to join these tours or she's failed to do, you know, but she would say to you, cause she said this to me, the work doesn't end. You don't stop. And maybe you're speaking from a position on the WTA Players Council because you're a top 10 player and you're Anastasia Pazipulyachenkova and you care about joining the tours and you're going to do it that way. Or maybe you're starting a video series and you're going to post and ask provocative questions. Maybe you're making an arts and culture magazine that's going to try to bring in people from outside the sport. All of that mm -hmm. stuff is additive. You need all of it. And the truth is, the more we get people engaged with this sport, the more the reasons for it not to succeed at the level for everybody that we see possible um the mm -hmm. longer the the less time that 
that that stays staying sane you know what i mean like the net the less time right. that that seems to make sense and so for me we're gonna do what we can me as an outsider you as an insider mm -hmm. outsider and my friends on the pro tour as the ultimate insiders but it takes mm -hmm. all of us doing that it's not just one person i mean maybe federer could do it you know god knows <laughs> you know this from training to be a tennis player your whole life um mm -hmm. and why which is you can you can't predict success you can just create the conditions for success right like mm -hmm. if roger federer mm -hmm. or you know say lebron james wanted to buy tennis under the condition that the tours were joined and we would fix all this stuff whatever it was some yeah. some incredibly cataclysmic huge act right <laughs> we can't control that we can't get those guys in the room but we can prepare for the 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 conversation for that to happen yeah. and well what can we do we can have the work we can have the conversations we can have the ideas if somebody said to me caitlin you're in charge we're going to join the wta and the atp tours what are you what are your first four things that you do i know what i do i know exactly go. Go. i go. join i i make only joint events i make the season really short i make it representative of every hemisphere keeping of course most of the slams or reorganizing them i make 10 events on the calendar i make them incorporate every part of the world so that we have truly global fanship and engagement. Um, I make everyone play best of three sets because five sets is too long and boring. I get rid of appearance fees. You just don't get them. Everybody gets paid what they earn. And I, more than anything else, and this is set coming from a media person, I immediately throw out the media that's been covering this sport forever. And I make everyone reapply for their credentials. Everyone who wants to talk about this sport, if you write for GQ or Vogue or, uh, you know, you're a television camera person from Vice, you're getting in. If you're somebody who's 185 years old and you're an old misogynist man who's been writing the same newspaper articles about tennis and never bothering to learn how to pronounce the player's name, you're out. You're There's a couple out. of fundamental things that you can do to really make yeah. this game um, succeed. And those are my ideas. They're not maybe the best ideas. But they're the ones that I think would be most useful and impactful. Um, mm -hmm. and I think you get rid of a lot of the conflicts of interest where you can't be the agent of somebody, but also commentating on their match, right? Like you just make it on the professional up and up. And I think tennis has been mm -hmm. really weird because it's languished in this sort of like, it's really big for what it is, but it's really small compared to these other sports. And so it, it's kind of a backwater and it gets away with a lot of stuff that would never happen in other sports, which is not to say other sports are totally clean, but like, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of, of so much double dipping and agents and, and commentators and, and it's just, it's, it's not doing anybody any favors. And so all we can do is try mm -hmm. to create the conditions to succeed. And I think people like you and I are really interested in, in trying to at least have the conversation so that if, and when that huge thing does mm -hmm. happen, we have a plan, you know, and the, and, and also it's fun to do this. So, you know, that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> give me two things. So give me a motto that you live by. Hmm. Oh man, I probably should have prepared this. You know, it's interesting. My family has a motto and I think it, it applies. It's something my wife and I decided when we got married and now we have it on a poster. Uh, it's stay positive, but keep your head on a swivel. That's the motto I live by. I, I'm somebody who believes in always being generous and always being thoughtful and always trying to give, give back and, and my career and my tennis and everything has always been about inclusivity and pulling in more people. But I'm also like keeping my head on a swivel, right? I'm, all, I'm always planning. I'm always trying to think of like, what's the big picture? Um, so stay yeah. positive and keep your head on a swivel is probably the closest thing to a motto that I have. Nice. And what's an advice that you would give Caitlin? Um, I'm going to go, since you told me your journey, I'm going to say at about leaving college. Be patient. It all works out. Find your okay. happiness in the moment because things that seem like they are, you know, huge obstacles at the moment are, are teaching you something. Mary Pierce, I keep mentioning her, but she just, she's in my head because we just talked to her yesterday and she said something really interesting when she was talking about um, the way she looked at success, right? She says, yeah, you win or you learn. Mm -hmm. She didn't say you win or you lose. She said you win or you learn. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's such a great way of thinking about it, right? There's no losses, there's learning. And I think when you think about life, whether it's professional or on the tennis court, you know, you can learn in every situation, even from winning, but just the idea that you're never, you're never taking a loss. You're never, you're never mm-hmm. losing something by going out on the court and getting your butt kicked. Certainly I never did. I learned something. I learned a lot of things. Sometimes it helped me become a better player or sometimes it helped me to become a better person, but it was still mm-hmm. my experience. And I think if I can go back and give myself some advice, it's just try to try to understand that what it seems hard in the moment is actually teaching you something. Uh, yeah. And if it's not, it doesn't feel like a win, then it's maybe an opportunity to learn. And it all works out because you end up doing something that you really like with people. You sure. really like. And that's, that's really cool. What about you? I'm curious about yours. Um, the motto would be more along the lines of really happiness is not guaranteed. Mm. Um, you have to make happy. You have to create your happy. So yeah. I think it goes along with that meaning thing, right? Like you have to find that meaning. Um, and advice for me uh, after college was maybe you should have prepared getting a sponsor earlier and you might have <laughs> had, the shot, had the shot to play. 